Okay. Uh, without further ado, here's Dr. Green. Howdy. Howdy. Am I on there, Andrew? Yeah, you're yeah, good to go. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, yeah, tonight's talk is on biblical inerrancy. Um, I'm going to give you a quick outline just so you understand kind of the format that I'm going for. I'm going to define and kind of d explain the doctrine of biblical inerrancy and why people believe it. And then I'll get into common alternative views. And then we'll talk about, like, how it is that people often argue about this and how they may actually miss each other or, or, or uh, argue, uh, you know, past each other a little bit. So tonight's, I guess what I'm telling you is, tonight's not the kind of event where um, I give my view and then we get to argue about it. It's more that I'm going to try to prime the pump for y'all to be able to talk to each other and with your fellow students about this doctrine and what it means and, uh, and how to define it well as opposed to defining it poorly. Okay? Um, <clears throat> As Nathan mentioned, we'll try to, to have some good discussion at the end. Uh, one thing I've done is I've kind of annotated my slides. Um, does anyone know who this is? Who's this? Bender. That's Bender. Okay, whenever you see Bender, I've tried to mark slides where it would be like good for us to go back and kind of talk through and argue with it after the fact. So if you see Bender, that's, a, that's a, just a signal of like, aha, we'll go back and talk about this later. Okay, so I'll first describe the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. The reason I'm, I make a big deal of this doctrine is that it's, it's, it's played a very central role in most of the major controversies within the evangelical world, especially in the U.S., in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and so you'll, you'll, you'll see why that's the case. It's actually turned into a, 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 one of those things that has divided churches, divided seminaries, and we have to say, like, well, wh why is that? Why is it so important? Why have people been, able, been willing to really, really go to bat over this issue and, and define it well? So if you open up the, the big, fat, systematic theology book from Wayne Grudem, he says, uh, the inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts properly interpreted underline, 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 does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So it doesn't affirm anything that's contrary to fact. And so um, in, in short, if you say uh, inerrancy, no errors, that means that the Bible doesn't say oops. Okay, so if you, only, if you only hear one sentence out of the entire talk, that would be the one. Is Biblical inerrancy means that the Bible doesn't say oops. Now, of course, in addition to errors, it also doesn't affirm a lie. It doesn't try to deceive you, that sort of thing. Um, there's numerous biblical grounds for thinking this, this is the case. If we think that the Bible is divinely inspired and God knows everything, why would God ever say oops? What, what knowledge is he going to gain that makes him say, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Sorry, I made a mistake. Um, and, and so you, you see lots of uh, connotations in the Psalms and in the Proverbs about how God's promises are always true. Um, he, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Uh, the biggest reason that Christians have defended the concept of inerrancy is because it seems to match with the way that Jesus treats the Old Testament. So if you start with the person of Christ and you say, how does he treat Scripture, which for him would be the Old Testament, um, he answers you know, his critics. He says, You're, you are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Um, this next one is a very in, in interesting little scenario. In John 10, um, the, the, Jesus is, is in danger of being stoned, and so the Jews say, oh, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, but you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? Now, there's this whole, you know, uh, dispute between the Pharisees and Jesus here in this scenario. But I want, what I want you to know is that mid-sentence, Jesus appeals to the Scripture, and he says, we both agree on this, right? The Scripture cannot be broken. We're on that, we're, we both agree on that, so therefore, why don't you believe this? It's something that he and his audience just assumed was true of the Old Testament. So he treats the Scripture as though it cannot be broken. Uh, more broadly, when you see throughout the, the epistles, um, Paul writes something like, all Scripture is breathed out. That's, we sometimes we say the Bible is inspired, but inspired is kind of vague. Like, you know, Olympic athletes may inspire you. That's not what we mean. We mean Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And, of course, we have good reason to believe that they not only applied that to Old Testament writings, but to what we now would, would refer to as the New Testament canon as well. Now, this is a little confusing because when you say the Bible is without error, uh, we have this old proverb saying, to err is human, and we say, well, the, the Bible was written by people, right? The authorship of the Bible is a little bit confusing because we, we would say it's the Word of God, and then at the same time, right at the beginning, beginning of these books, it'll say written by so-and-so, so there's a human author as well. And so people have argued for a long time about how biblical inspiration works. 
uh, uh, there's this, this one famous verse along those lines. Uh, Peter writes, For no prophecy was ever produced by will of man, the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of unclear on how we, sh- we ought to interpret that particular phrase. Um, some people have subscribed to, to some kind of dictation theory. And if you say, well, what does that mean? Um, all of you are probably familiar with this. At some point you decided, I hate typing. I hate typing a text, so I'm going to hit that little magic microphone button on my cell phone and say, I'm going to speak my text into my cell phone, or I'm going to speak an email into my cell phone, and it will dictate what I say. And then you look at what it actually wrote, and you're very disappointed because it messed up every fifth word, right? So, um, so generally, throughout the, 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 the centuries, Christians have not believed in a dictation theory. We don't say that, that a human being just said, I'm just writing whatever God tells me. You can actually read different, different books in the Bible and tell that those human authors are writing in their own voice as opposed to just typing down exactly whatever the Holy Spirit whispered in their ear. Note, by the way, that uh, within Islam, they generally do ascribe to some kind of dictation theory when it comes to the Quran. Um, and so the way Christians would explain divine inspiration is that the human author writes in their own voice. You can, you can practically hear the accent from every individual author, but that God preserves Scripture f- uh, from human error uh, so that it, it communicates what he wanted, wants to communicate in the way he wanted to communicate it. So that's generally the way that a proponent of inerrancy would describe this. Now, uh, Zach and I have talked about this before, that there are a number of qualifications. Am I making a mistake? Oh, is it freaking out on me? Oh. All right, we're back. All right, good. There are a number of qualifications, and I'll try to like, not touch this thing so it'll be okay. So um, inerrancy, if you read any book on inerrancy or, or try to learn about it, uh, one of the things you'll notice is they give this long, long, long list of qualifications, meaning inerrancy doesn't necessarily uh, uh, assume all the, this long list of, of factors mostly related to precision. Uh, so, for instance, there, uh, I know there are a lot of engineers and possibly mathematicians or physicists in the room. There is a place in the Old Testament where it talks about some kind of circular tent and gives the, the, the diameter, right, and the circumference. And you do the math, and it looks like pi is equal to 3, and you go, I can't, I can't deal. You know, and so you say, pi can't be 3. So there's stuff like that. There's rounded numbers in Scripture. Of course, lots of times where they have a census, or they talk about the number of people who are present at an event. And so they're round numbers like that. There are an enormous number of loose quotations. If you ever see the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament, and you compare the New Testament quotation with what you see in your Old Testament, sometimes you're like, eh, that's not exactly the same, probably because the New Testament author was using the Septuagint or something like that. And, uh, and what, if you ask the biblical author, like, hey, what gives? They would probably say, like, hey, that's the way we do it. We don't subscribe to your 21st century newspaper reporter quotation marks, exact word-for-word quotation methodology. So, so inerrancy allows for very loose quotations. And then finally, I'll just say unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions. And if you say, well, what does that mean? Um, I don't know if you can tell. I'm originally from West Texas. Um, I hide my accent a little bit so that people don't judge me. Um, but I do have one. It is in there. Uh, if you've ever thought, like, well, what does a West Texas accent sound like? Um, watch the, the movie No Country for Old Men. Uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones has got it nailed. I, I remember thinking, like, that is exactly what I grew up with. And then I looked it up, and Tommy Lee Jones uh, grew up in Midland, so he's not even acting. That's just real. So just to give you an example of what I would consider an unusual or uncommon grammatical construction, uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad, would say a phrase like, uh, like if you told him something that was surprising, perhaps, he would say, well, I'll be darned. you say, excuse me, pardon, come again? Well, I'll be darned. So that's, well, I'll be darned, but said very quickly in a West Texas accent. And so the Bible includes the kind of the redneck West Texas equivalent of, well, I'll be darned. Like there's things like that in there. And we just have to say that's the human author's voice. And we don't say like, you made an error. That was bad. We say that's, that's the human author speaking. And inerrancy doesn't wipe away things like that. So, so, those, so you can kind of see the direction I'm going is that if you promote the view of inerrancy, you have to make really, really sure that you don't impose modern definitions of accuracy or historicity on the Bible. Um, perhaps an example I could give you is, or an illustration I can give you is, if you went to another country, like let's say you went to Australia. Um, I have had the pleasure of driving in Australia, and for an American it's a little bit like not the right side, the other side, the other side. And so you drive on the left-hand side in Australia or any other other place that the, the British have left their mark, right? And so, uh, but you can imagine, if you went to Australia and you heard an American say like, well, in my country, we don't drive on that side of the road, you would be embarrassed. You would pretend to be Canadian, you know, because you, you don't want to be associated with them. Because you would say, we're not in your country. We're not in your country, so we're going to adapt 
We're going we're gonna to adopt the customs of the locals while we're here in this country. When you read scripture, you are de facto in another country and another time. And so it would be, it would be um, out of place for us to go to the Bible and then start griping at them for not conforming to our 21st century American standards. Okay? So just, just like it would be rude for us to go to Australia and do the same thing. Um, here's an example. Uh, in Matthew uh, uh, 13, uh, it says, Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So that's the quote. Um, the problem with this is when you, you dig into it and you find out, like, the, this text says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but that's not actually true. There are seeds that are smaller than the mustard seed. And so is, is there a mistake? You can kind of tell, like, if you, went, if you went to Matthew and said, Matthew, you've made a mistake. The mustard seed's not the smallest of all seeds. Um, he, he probably is not going to respond with oops. He's going to give that response that you give to someone whenever someone tells you, well, actually, blah, blah, blah. Any phrase that starts, well, actually, is never, is never followed up with, like, thank you, I made a mistake. It's always, like, it's always a rolling of the eyes, like, all right, all right, calm down, you know? And so that's basically what Matthew would say to you. And so he would say, for my audience, when they hear that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, it's like the smallest of all seeds that they use for farming that they deal with on a regular basis, not the smallest of all seeds that exist in the universe. He, and he, would, he would be irritated at you for saying, well, actually, me, me. So many, many challenges to, to Scripture, saying, oh, there's an error here, there's an error there, basically fall under that category. Um, the most well-known would be the challenges um, to uh, uh, the Gospels. Four Gospels are all telling the same story in principle, um, but the chronology, you may have noticed, is sometimes off. Uh, there are a couple of examples of that. One is in Christ's temptations. If you go to Matthew, it goes... Uh, 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 he's t- Jesus is tempted to turn stones into bread, then he's tempted to jump off the temple, and then he's tempted to worship Satan. But if you go to Luke, then it goes stones worship temple rather than stones temple worship. So what's the deal? And for a long time, uh, especially in the English-speaking world, people would rack their brains and say, like, well, like they get these diagrams and draw big things and say, maybe it happened twice but in different orders. But the truth is that, like, for first-century biographies, Chronology was not always uppermost. They would tell stories out of order in order to get a specific point across. And so if you went to Luke and said, like, hey, your story's out of order, he would say, like, hey, I didn't, I, I, that's not my genre to tell things in exact chronological order. I don't have that expectation, and my audience doesn't have that expectation, so you shouldn't either. Um, this same kind of thing shows up uh, if you read all the Gospels and, fe- and try to think, when does Jesus cleanse the temple? In, in the synoptics, Uh, Jesus cleanses the temple very late in his ministry, like close to when the crucifixion is. But if you read the book of John, it happens really early in the story. And so, again, you could, you know, pull your hair out and try to make a chronology where Jesus does it twice in his ministry. But the truth is that they tell things out of order, and that's okay. That doesn't constitute an error. Just think if you talk to the biblical author and said, hey, this is out of order, they're not going to respond with an oops. Now, I can imagine, however, some of y'all may say, all right, perhaps they're not saying oops, but this is kind of frustrating. It's kind of misleading that anytime I see what I think is an error, they say like, oh, you're misinterpreting me. Um, the, the movie scene that came to my mind is, um, if you all remember, in Return of the Jedi, uh, Luke understandably goes to Obi-Wan and he said, so you didn't really tell me the whole story about the, the Darth Vader thing. You told me my father was killed by Darth Vader, not that my father is Darth Vader. So what gives? And Obi-Wan Kenobi gives this like super unsatisfying explanation of like, well, blah, 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 what I told you is true so from a certain point of view. And that's not very satisfying. And so I recognize that if we try to explain away every biblical difficulty with like, oh, you're from a certain point of view, like that, I recognize that that can be frustrating, okay? Um, that's certainly how I felt when I'm like, this, why is the story told out of order? Are you trying to trick me? What's the deal? So if you feel that flustered in that way, I think that's, that's pretty understandable. But ultimately, a lot of that boils down to in our 20th or 21st century mindset, we do kind of read the Gospels or we read whatever account as if it's a video camera. This is a video camera. This is the transcript of what is I see on the video camera. Go. Like that's, that's the expectation we typically come with. And so I think a helpful illustration is to think of what you read in the Bible as a, a photo as opposed to a portrait. Can anyone tell me who, who's this woman, by the way? 
Yeah, this is Michelle Obama. This is the official portrait. Um, I think it's kind of cool. My wife was like, I hate this portrait, but whatever. Anyway, this is in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. now. And um, it's, the, part of the reason it's weird is it seems like the, the artist is very obsessed with all the intricacies of this dress and, and not as much with the First Lady herself. But the idea is in a portrait, you emphasize some things and not others. It's not supposed to be a precise photograph with perfect, perfect detail. And if you went to the artist and said, oh, but what about this, what about that? They're not going to say oops. They'll say, this is what I was emphasizing. And my deviation from what a photograph is does not constitute an oops. Does that make sense? Okay. One other thing you might worry about is um, uh, there, there, are copying editor, editor, uh, 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 there are copying errors for sure. If you look in the footnotes in your Bible on any given page, it'll say some manuscripts say blah, 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 and it'll show little differences from one page to the other. And so um, the, the doctrine of inerrancy uh, argues that only the autographer are inerrant, okay? So we have lots of old copies of Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is the famous Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we don't have the original, like, written by Isaiah scroll. Um, similarly, we don't have uh, the original written by John, written by Peter, whomever. We don't have the, their original works. Um, the, the most extant, like, full-blown, full uh, the entire Greek New Testament, the example that we have is the Codex Sinaiticus, which you can go see in the British Library in London, but it's from the 300s. It's not from the 100s or, or the first century itself. And so you may think, what's the point of this whole inerrancy debate anyway? If only the autographer, meaning the original copies, are, are um, inerrant and we don't have them, then what's the point? What's the point of arguing about this? And the answer is um, that you can, you can, be, uh, you can have confidence that we have access to the autographer. So this is an example. Like if the original text says the only son of God, and then two people make copies saying the only son of God, and then somewhere along the line, someone makes a mistake, and they omit the word only, and then whoever copies from them uh, continues to omit the, the word only, then here in the present, we have a bunch of manuscripts. Some say the only son of God. Some just say the son of God. Then your Bible would have a, have a footnote. And they would say, most of the texts say only Son of God, and the oldest texts we have say only Son of God. And so you can be confident that the original text said only. Um, similarly, we could do an illustration here where if I wrote out something on a page and I asked each one of you to copy it by hand, and you all copy it by hand, let's just say that every last one of you makes a mistake. You're not all going to make the same mistake. Even if we destroyed my original, by looking at all of your copies, we could piece together what the original was because at every word, it's kind of, you know, 29 to 1. It's, the, it's about that ratio. You could figure out who made the mistake on any given word. And so although we don't have the originals, you can have great confidence that you have access to what the original manuscript actually said. Okay? Um, however, this idea, that, I, I will tell you, this idea that the autographer are inerrant is a little murky when you realize that like a lot of biblical uh, uh, books, especially in the Old Testament, are, are cobbling together from multiple sources, right? Certainly the Psalms are that way. Some, uh, some people think the book of Daniel is that way. There are multiple stories coming together to form that book. So at what point is it inspired and inerrant? Is it the original story or was it with the editor who chose which parts are going to go into the book of Daniel? Um, I think that's a, that's a murky question that's hard to get into. Um, a related question is, how do we know the right books are in the Bible? That has to do with the formation of the canon. That's another talk unto itself. I have given talks on that topic before. If you're interested, email me and I'll give you some slides. So that gets you the basic idea of the doctrine of inerrancy as it's promoted in most evangelical churches throughout the country. Um, if you wonder, well, what are the alternative views? If someone says, I don't believe in inerrancy, but I am still a Christian and I believe in the authority of Scripture, what are they likely to say? Um, a common confusing word is to hear about the Bible being infallible. Now, based on normal English, something being inerrant and infallible kind of sounds like the same thing. If you hear people use this term, usually like the controversy that's bubbling beneath the surface is the person who believes in inerrancy it says like no errors, no matter what, in all that the Bible affirms. But a person who uses the word infallible, oftentimes what they mean is that the Bible is authoritative and makes no errors in telling us the truth we need for faith and practice. However, if the Bible says something about science or about history that happens to be wrong, that's okay because it's not ultimately about science or history. Um, it's, a, it's about faith and practice and how we're supposed to live before God. So that's the infallible view. Um, you can imagine why someone would say this, like the mustard seed example I, I gave a moment ago. The, uh, you could say, well, the Bible's not about science. It's not, a t it's, it's not about tell telling us about botany. So therefore, I'm going to ignore that mustard seed problem. That's one way that you would get, get around this. Similarly, if you had concerns about, about the first chapters of Genesis, someone might say, 
well, Genesis 1 is not trying to tell us about when the origin of the, the, the physical chunk of rock that we call the moon. It's about God instituting the moon, you know, it's, it, that, that kind of thing. So I can understand why someone would, would, would think this. However, whenever, whenever the Bible couches a story in terms of history, there is this Roman ruler named Pontius Pilate who spoke to Jesus. If we later find out there is no Pontius Pilate or he actually lived 200 years later or 200 years earlier, it's pretty difficult to extricate the faith and practice from the history in that circumstance. Uh, The other concern I have with this infallible view is that it doesn't seem like Jesus really treats the Old Testament this way. Um, On the walk to Emmaus, he tells his disciples that they're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So it's hard to see this infallible view uh, that's somewhat selective coming out of Jesus' mouth. Uh, another related view is what is frequently called accommodation. Uh, biblical writers may have accommodated their messages in minor details to the false ideas current in their day. And um, the idea is that if people all believe some false thing, it's going to be hard to avoid, like, you don't want to have to correct every false belief that someone has in order to communicate with them. So you may just use language that kind of goes along with that false idea. And if that sounds bad, we actually do it all the time. Every time you say the word sunrise, You're accommodating yourself to this kind of false view that we all have, that the sun appears to rise, even though we know that's not actually true. Um, uh, So that can apply to things like ancient cosmology. So if you describe the way the sun and the moon work, you don't want to have to, God would not want to to explain all of modern physics to them in order to get get the message across. He may use ideas related to ancient cosmology in that that regard. Another um, accommodation example that I've heard thrown out is that ancient people believed that uh, diseases were related to demons, and so maybe all this demon talk in the New Testament is some some stand-in for something medical. That seems a little bit rougher to me. It's, it's, It's harder for me to accept that. Um, perhaps a useful distinction might be the distinction between saying that God adapts his, what he says in the Bible to what we can understand versus accommodating error. And perhaps a, a silly example I can give you is if, um, if my six-year-old really, really, really wants to know where babies come from, like there are some, I can adapt what I'm going to tell her to her level and not give her a whole lot of detail generally tell her like, well, mommy and daddy love each other very much, blah, 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 and tell her something that's true, but I'm adapting it to what she can understand. However, if I start telling her something about storks, I'm actually introducing error. I'm introducing something false. And so, so I think that might go beyond the pale to, to have someone do that. They would actually be uh, uh, making an error or, or committing some kind of deception if they added it to that point. And so, um, so this is a, this, I think this distinction is, is is potentially helpful. Um, one thing I found out is that this controversy of like, how does God accommodate himself to our finite minds and our limited language and our understanding of the world, it actually goes back a long way. I, I heard a really interesting phrase. This goes all the way back to John Calvin. John Calvin talks about scripture and he said, when God speaks to us, God lisps. And I thought, what an interesting turn of phrase, the idea that like if, if, if we can't say our S's properly and God speaks to us and also doesn't say his S's properly so that we can understand him, um, this idea that God comes to our level for the sake of communication. If, if you just heard that, that explanation, you might think it was from the 19th or the 20th century, but it's actually from Calvin himself back in the 1500s. Um, just to help, the, the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about how this plays out in Christian communities, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe to you an interaction between three people, and this interaction I'm about to describe to you has happened over and over and over again in churches and seminaries, especially in the United States, over the last 30 or 40 years, okay? So, uh, I'm going to describe three people to you, and I'll use the book of Jonah as my example text, okay? So, I want you to really put your thinking hats on and see how you would talk to these three people. Okay, so person A believes that the book of Jonah is intended by the author to accurately record something that actually historical ha- historically happened, a prophet named Jonah who did all these things, and person A believes it, whale and all, okay? So that's person A. Person B thinks the author of the book of Jonah was telling a morality tale to, to instruct the people of Israel and how they had lost their sense of compassion and forgotten all that God had, had forgiven them for. And so person B thinks the author of the book of Jonah and the audience did not intend it to be taken literally. Instead, it's a word picture of Israel's lack of mercy. Okay, that's person B. Person C thinks 
Well, ancient people may have thought it was physically impossible to, possible to be ingested by a whale and survive it. But now with modern science, we know that's not actually true. So we can read the book of Jonah. We see there's this, this story, this kind of fantasy kind of story about someone being swallowed by a whale and surviving. We know that's not true, but we can still pull out the, the, the moral core of the story and see what God is trying to tell us. All right, did these three people make sense to you? All right. So here is what I want you to see from this description. Person A clearly believes in inerrancy. They say, the Bible says it, here's how it's meant to be taken, I believe it. Person C pretty clearly doesn't. Person C says, like, yeah, there's stuff in there, but, like, uh, I don't know, this part, this part about the whale, part is, maybe they thought it was historical, but it's actually not. But God can still speak to us through this story. So person C definitely doesn't believe in inerrancy. The trick is person B. Does person B, as I've written it here, could they believe in inerrancy? The answer is yes, they do, because both person A and person B are saying, what did the author intend to get across? How would it be understood? What's the best way to interpret the book of Jonah? Okay? However, so in that sense, person A and person B should be friends, and, and they, they disagree on how to interpret this text, but in, in terms of like the theological rules that they apply to the Bible, they should be on the same team. However, what has actually happened in practice uh, over, the, over the last 30, 40 years is that person A almost always shuns person B because they think person B is actually person C in disguise. <laughs> and here's the thing. There, there are times when person A has been suspicious and person A has been right. That stuff has happened. People who don't actually believe in inerrancy would say like, oh, I interpret it this way. But like when you really dig beneath the surface, they don't actually believe that the Bible is free of errors. And so um, it really harms dialogue. If, you, if, you, if, if one person thinks the other is operating in bad faith, then how is anybody going to trust each other? And you can imagine per person B tends to be pretty offended at person A for not believing them in the first place. So this dynamic where two people who apparently both take the authority of Scripture very seriously and yet they still shun each other, this has happened over and over and over again. And if you say, like, why was there this big fight in my church? Um, some of you may ask your pastor, you say, um, do you believe in inerrancy? And then they make a little face and they go, ooh. They, they say, I mean, I believe in the authority of Scripture, but this inerrancy thing, and they make a face. The reason they make the face is because they've seen this little fight happen too many times. This also shows you that sometimes if someone hears the word inerrancy, they're not just hearing the Bible is free from error. They're hearing, and you must interpret it this way. So I'll just tell you right now, the church I grew up in, if you did not interpret the first few chapters of Genesis in a particular way, then they would say you don't believe in inerrancy. So they're, they're, they're wandering into exactly this circumstance. Like, you have to interpret it my way. The only possible reason you could have for not interpreting it my way is to hide the fact that you don't really believe it. And so this distrust, this fight, happens all over the place. So I would advocate to you, the key is, do you really care about what the text is saying, and are you willing to believe it and submit to it? And in principle, believing in inerrancy shouldn't pre-commit you to a particular interpretation. You should be able to, to discuss with each other what does the text mean. Yeah. Does that also apply to morality and looking at the morals of the Old Testament? In principle, yes. In principle, yes, that's true. Uh, this, same, this same, like, it shouldn't imply a predefined particular interpretation. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so I'm almost done. We'll, we'll, we'll open it up. If you talk to someone who, who advocates for inerrancy, I will tell you the reason that they make a big, big, big deal of it is because it's connected to biblical authority. Augustine himself, he said, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospels you believe, but yourself. So if you admit the possibility of error, and then you make yourself the judge of that's an error and that's not, that's an error and that's not, you're ultimately making the filter for truth yourself. And so someone who advocates for inerrancy, this is what they're really worried about, is that if you allow for errors, then you basically undercut the authority of the Bible. Now, Augustine of Hippo is not to be confused with um, Augustine of Hip Hop, which is a Twitter account that everyone <laughs> should be following. It's basically, imagine Lin-Manuel Miranda like, started reading a lot of theology. and Anyway, half of them are in Latin. So, anyway. Uh, I'm going long, so I'm going to skip this next line. But anyway, um, so just to let you know, the, the circumstances where people usually are, are frustrated at the concept of, of inerrancy usually relates to what are perceived as biblical contradictions, like the ones we talked about earlier, um, especially things like, 
Was there one woman who went to the tomb of Jesus, or was there two or three? Was there one angel there, or was there two? You know, those kinds of things. Did this happen? How many times did the rooster crow before Peter betrayed Jesus? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, miracle claims like the virgin birth. I think that's a, the idea of, of why miracles are possible is a talk for a different day. The truth is, in your faith communities, the main reason, this relates to your point, the main area where inerrancy is likely to be attacked day in, day out is on questions of sexuality. Right? That's just a fact. That's the reason that people yell and fight with each other about this topic. So uh, the takeaway message is uh, if the concept of inerrancy is that the Bible doesn't say oops, but someone who advocates for inerrancy is not ultimately, they're not mainly worried about inerrancy, they're worried about authority. That if you allow for errors in the Bible, you effectively undercut all the authority of Scripture. So if you find yourself saying, I don't buy this inerrancy thing, you do need to be able to explain to someone in what way does the Bible have authority over you, where if the Bible says something that you don't like, that you submit to in any way. That's, that's, uh, that's the way we'd want to say that the Bible still has authority for, over the Christian in some way. Um, and I, I do want to caution you, like, be really, like, be nice to each other. <laughs> like, if someone, I, I've seen it happen so many times where someone has a particular interpretation of Scripture and someone else is like, you don't really believe the Bible. Like, you're having an interpretation fight, not an inerrancy fight. So please be nice to each other. And if you're confront if, if, if uh, the idea of, like, someone saying, I found a contradiction in Scripture, uh, I think a lot of Christians are like, ah, like they freak out, and they're like, what are we going to do? Like, if, if that's your circumstance, what I would encourage you is don't freak out when someone confronts you with an apparent inconsistency with, inconsistency with Scripture. Actually dig into the details and say, is this really a contradiction? Are we sure we're interpreting it right? Are we sure we're understanding it according to the genre that it was actually written in? So, okay, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Don't forget about the... Uh Yes, there's a fancy microphone here and here. So, okay, awesome, thanks. Okay, so uh, with regards to the, you, you don't have to get real close. Your okay, you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so with regards to inerrancy in the Old Testament, unless you go to the Old Testament passages about things regarding like, uh, uh, like killing disobedient children or like homosexuals, with without a predefined answer. Mm -hmm you're probably going to come to some uh, bad conclusions if you, because especially if you read them in their own context and rather than like ha jumping like later scriptures onto it, you're going to come up with some uh, not so good uh, conclusions. Sure. So, so again, that relates more so to the topic of, of interpretation. I can imagine two Christians who uh, both are committed to inerrancy, and they both say, here's what the old, this Old Testament Levitical law or whatever may, meant in its context. But then they would start really disagreeing with each other about how does that have implications for us today? We don't live in a, uh, uh, you know, a, a society like ancient Israel. We live in a, a pluralistic, uh, modern secular society. So does those, how do those laws apply to us? How do they apply to Christians? How do they apply to non-Christians? How do they apply to our own laws? Um, but I would think that that's a, much more of an interpretation question of how does this apply to, to us today. I wouldn't necessarily put that under the rubric of, of is the Bible making an error or I don't not. want to say, I think that that kind of leeway would require relativism because in, or, in, in order to say that, you would have to imply that the moral truths change from the Old Testament to now. Uh, you're, you're welcome to believe that. I'm just saying okay. that's, a okay. that's a difference of interpretation. Okay. I'm not advocating for either view. I'm saying if two Christians are disagreeing with each other about that, and maybe you do disagree with some other Christian about that, then you, that's, a, that's an interpretation difficulty of like, what is this Old Testament passage? How does it apply to, to New Testament believers? Um, before you were saying that, <clears throat> I guess if two Christians are dis disagreeing or they have disputes some, about the interpretation, you have to really dig deeper and find out, you know, if you're interpreting it correctly, you're interpreting it right. And then the very first quote, or one of the first quotes you put on the, on the board <clears throat> was talking about it had underlined... Properly interpreted. Um, properly interpreted. Yeah. What, what does that mean? And how do you, um, like, how do you know who's right? Yeah. So the, the, this is one of those ones where it's like, um, you got to do the hard work. There are different approaches to interpretation, but generally uh, an advocate of inerrancy would say, um, you want to interpret the Bible uh, uh, according to the author's intent in the context that it was originally given to understand what the author meant. Now, it's an additional step beyond that to figure out, like, what application does that have to us today? That gets to the question about the Old Testament mm -hmm. application. So you could, you, uh, uh, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So um, this is not a simple question because if, if we had this same discussion in the 1200s, mm -hmm. 
then there might, people might say, oh, we have these predefined rules that every text must be able to be interpreted in an allegorical way, blah, 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 and then that they get weird allegorical interpretations. So um, generally I find it's, it's, uh, if you, it's best to set ground rules ahead of time, or what do, what do we mean when we say when we want to interpret Scripture properly? So, yeah. So this question actually dovetails really nicely with that one. Um, the, the first que or the question is, is inerrancy a starting point or is it a conclusion? And here's specifically what I mean by that. Because sometimes I'll have arguments about what it means to, for something to be properly interpreted. Mm -hmm. And then I'm informed, ah, but that will entail an error. So therefore it can't be the proper interpretation. So in that case, inerrancy is saying, ah, well, we can rule out these as proper interpretations because they'll entail an error. Uh, so it seems to me like uh, a lot of times people will take inerrancy as their starting point and say, well, since the Bible's inerrant, this can't be the interpretation, rather mm -hmm. than saying, mm -hmm. since this is the proper interpretation and it's not erroneous, we can include inerrancy. So succinctly, inerrancy, conclusion or starting point? That's a, that, this is a great question. Um, I think this is probably the strongest critique of inerrancy. Like if you go into an academic like seminary, that sort of thing, they would think if we pre-commit ourselves to inerrancy, we're actually like limiting the scope of possible of interpretations. We are limiting our interpretation ahead of time. That's the biggest reason most people have an issue with it. So one example would be, I, I told you that there have been many circumstances of people trying to say like, I'm going to line up all the Gospels on a big whiteboard and then figure out this happened and then this happened and then this happened and wait, uh, this can't mean that because that would mean this has to happen before that, but it can't happen before that, so therefore that must be wrong. And so um, I, I guess in, in those circumstances, usually what I would say is, uh, uh, it may limit out certain interpretations, or it may also th fall into, bring into question what constitutes an error. Yeah. So for me, I would, in the past, I'm, like, I might have said, Luke can't mean that th this because then it would be out of order, and that would be an error. Instead of redoing my interp earlier interpretation, I might have to reevaluate what constitutes an error. Luke t now I think Luke telling a story out of order is not actually an error. Like that just belongs to the genre. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the phenomenon has to actually fit. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. The, the real reason people put these inerrancy kind of things on there is because they're worried about the authority question. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually, it usually belongs in kind of a slippery slope kind of, kind of argument. Like if we, allow, if we allow ourselves to start picking and choosing, that part of the Bible's an error and that part, of, that part is not, then where will we be? And so that's the reason they pre-commit to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it could be you start off at such a high point that anything below you is a slippery slope. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. So I've read that the New Orthodox view, I think it was specifically applied or attached to inspiration. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so they kind of say that, or what I've read is that they, see, they say the Bible is the words of God as opposed to the word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, I don't know if you've read little stuff bit, little about bit, that. Yeah. And like, I don't really get the difference between that at all. And like some people say that Jesus is the word of God and, well, I mean, John says that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Bible being the word of God versus Jesus' word of God versus like Bible being the words of God. I don't know, can you just talk about that? Sure, yeah. yeah. So those are both really good questions. Um, so the, the neo-Orthodox view that was mentioned, it's most commonly associated with a guy named Karl Barth, who's a, 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 a German theologian. Um, and he would say things like, the Bible becomes the word of God to me when I read it, like God speaks to me through it. I think the infallibility view that I mentioned earlier, like kind of fits pretty nicely with that. Um, and I, and in, uh, in almost all cases, so when someone says that, they're trying to avoid like pre-committing themselves to, um, you'll hear people use the term a wooden literalism. You know, like they don't, they're worried that if I, if I take this literally, then it'll lead to an error. So they want to give themselves a little bit of an out. Um, I hesitate to say too much more about neo-orthodoxy because they're, they're notoriously slippery with their words. Um, to me, a great test, and I, if, I, if Karl Barth were here, I would ask him this. A great test is like, when you come up against something in Scripture that you're like, I don't like that, then what do you do? If you find yourself explaining it away or saying like, meh, that's not really the Word of God to me. Like, if you find yourself weaseling out of it, then that's, that's probably not a, a, a great sign. Um, you, like, if you're really submitting to the authority of Scripture, there should be, should be places that you're like, I don't like that. 
Um, to tell the truth, and, and this will hopefully shed a lot of light, when you think about, think about like the fights that churches have had over ordination of women, right? The truth is, for most of these churches, the fight is not really about ordination of women. The fight is that they think, oh, we're ca-, the, the worry is that they say, oh, crud, I think we're caving to the culture. We're caving because we don't want this to be true. And so they're worried about the slippery slope that they'll go down. So it's almost like they see that issue not for the issue itself, but as a symptom of not believing in the authority of Scripture. So the, uh, the second question was about um, the Bible as the Word of God versus Jesus as the Word of God. And I think by this point, people have kind of said, like, we, we want to start with Jesus and take our cues on what we believe about Scripture from Jesus. I tried to do the same thing tonight. Like, what does Jesus believe about Scripture? Um, but there have been, certainly been, um, there have been criticisms of the inerrancy view. Uh, you'll, you'll even hear people use the word bibliolatry. Saying, like, you worship the Bible, you believe it's, and it's, it's some of the language I used. It's both human and divine. Like, that does sound like Jesus, right? And so, um, anyway, there's been lots of fights and things about that, that, that people are focused too much on Scripture and not enough on the person of Christ. Um, I don't know if there's substantial theological r- real issue behind that, but that's, that's the context where you're, you'll, you'll hear that. So, that's happened actually a lot here in Texas. Like, if you go up to Baylor and say, tell me about the controversies within your seminary, it's exactly this kind of stuff. So... Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Sir. Is the proper interpretation what uh, the author thought they were writing? Oh, this is a good question. In most circumstances, it seems like the answer is yes, but there's a lot of parts in Scripture where you're like, I don't think the author knew. Like, think about Jeremiah or like a lot of the prophets. If you, if you, if they may have been prophesying something that they don't know what the, the interpretation of the prophecy is going to be. So they're not necessarily in a position of knowing like the best way to interpret it. So generally, I would say it's best to go with author's intent and what they thought their audience would, would, would say. But I think that's a slippery question. This is a good one to continue debating later in the evening, I think. Could I, 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 would, I would add Zach's question in there, too, of like, do I start with an inerrancy or not? That's a good one to kind of continue. Can I to. talk to you? Yeah, sure. For, oh, like after. Okay, so like, yeah. in, it feels like taking an inerrancy, you're, t- you're just like moral objectivism versus relativism, right? And it mm-hmm. seems like the only way to like actually... Like consider the Old Testament inerrant is to adopt a sort of rel- either you've got try the two horns that either you take a relativistic view and like oh no that stuff is that stuff was okay back then, but it's it's evil now like slavery or the list goes on, and slavery the Amadekites the Midianites and a lot of and in order to say those things were what God intended to, you almost by default have to take either a relativistic view like that's okay back then not now or the absolutist view that we should be doing that kind of stuff that that hmm. stuff is fine today i think you may be defining the word relativism differently than i would like it's my definition should be that morality sta- is like unchanging it's absolute it will uh-huh. not necessarily absolute but it's unchanging it's what over time saying. yeah it's unchanging that's oh, i see discuss it after sure sure after sure after sure after. yeah howdy uh Howdy. My question was, what do you think like the hardest to explain error would be in Scripture, and what would be your Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I actually listened to uh, Wayne Grudem has a great set of podcasts where he teaches through his book, and it was helpful to hear him go through it and talk about talk about these specific examples. There are a couple of places where it seems like there's some some history. Like some names are wrong or things are in the wrong order. And it's, it's like, it, it would, it, for me, it would have to be related to something very objective related to history. Like if the Bible gets the name of a ruler wrong or, you know, I, I don't know. It would, it, those are the kind of things that worry me the most. Um, because I don't, that's the closest you could get to a biblical author actually saying, oops. Like you wrote it was this person, but it was actually that person. Uh, when the census happened, it wasn't Quirinius who was governor of Syria. It was this other person. Oh, oops. Like, that's the stuff that probably bothers me the most in that regard. Yeah. That, that said, I don't actually, I, I really, so I don't, I've been kind of cagey, but I really do believe in inerrancy. I do. And the way my dad explained it to me, so I'll tell you the story because I think it's helpful. I was seven years old, and I went, I like found what I thought was an inconsistency in two accounts in the Gospels, mostly related. I was like, did Jesus say this or did he say this? And this happened first or that happened first? And I asked someone in my church and they basically were like, shut up, be gone, you know. And I was like, what the heck, you know. I mean, it was kind of like quiet whippersnapper. But like I, I, I asked my dad about it and my dad, I will never forget this. Like my dad like took me by the face and he said, you can ask whatever question you want. The Bible can take it. 
And it was so helpful for me to hear that. He's basically saying, like, you don't have to be scared. The Bible has this, like, kind of trustworthy track record so that when someone says, like, what about this? Instead of freaking out and going, oh, my, you could say, like, the Bible has this trustworthy track record. So now in this little moment of uncertainty, I'm going to say, eh, I don't actually know. I'll try to figure this out. But the Bible's so trustworthy in the past that I'm going to trust it now in this circumstance, too. That's what you would do with your trustworthy friend. They're trustworthy. So then in the moment where it's like, eh, I don't know, then you trust them in that moment as well. Yeah. So in your slides, you talk about the accommodation view. Mm -hmm. and then I remember a comparison between the adaptation. Adaptation, view, yeah, yeah. But I don't recall, like, what is the ad adaptation view? Like, I didn't see it. So, discussion. yeah, I know that, I mean, this, so, so, um, yeah, go ahead, Glenn. This is good. Yeah, go ahead. The, the distinction between adaptation and accommodation, you use the, the, the story of the stork, uh, mm -hmm. just to play off on that. Uh, one of them would be, uh, the babies in mommy's tummy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other one would be the stork brought it. Right. Okay. So one of them is sort of the truth. It's just not all of the truth because you're not prepared yet to mm. handle the details. Okay. The other one is a falsehood uh, that's been introduced uh, to uh, accommodate. Right. Right. So that, that's yeah. right. So actually, this word equivocal, if you hear about it, something being equivocal or equivocation, that's when someone. There, there's some phrase that can be meant two different ways, and they say it one way, and you're like, I got it. And they're like, ah, I tricked you. I meant it the other way. Like, I think Obi-Wan Kenobi is totally over here, right? Like, oh, I said Darth Vader killed your father, but he actually, like, kind of killed your father. I meant it the other way. Like, I think, we, I think Luke would be right to, like, give Obi-Wan a kick in his ghost shin because he's, he was misled, right? And so I, don't, I think it would be hard to put Obi-Wan Kenobi in this category. Does that make sense? Yeah. To, uh, to play off on, on some... Uh, specific examples of how this actually plays out in reality is uh, there the modern inerrantist movement was a reaction to people that already slipped down the slope there right. were people that were denying miracles denying that Jesus rose from the dead uh, denying virgin birth uh, denying the basic historicity whether Jesus came in the first place and they would take for example Jesus resurrection and say well, we don't really believe people rise from the dead. It's just whether or not uh, he rose in your heart. Right. See, right whether right. it's a spiritual application. And so that's why people got so passionate uh, about the inerrancy uh, uh, of movement is, is, is because of these things. It was a reaction to yeah. people that already slipped down the slope. That, that's exactly right. A um, yeah. couple of comments and, and let you uh, deal with there's to, to to get an idea. There's there, all those things you pointed out are are are, are true, uh, but yet there's places, for example, Matthew 22, where Jesus makes a point about uh, present and past tense verbs. He is the God. I am the God mm -hmm. of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of the living, not the dead. Mm -hmm. So uh, extends to present and past tense verbs. Over in Galatians 3, we have Paul making a point about uh, seed versus seeds and making a, a prophet, prophetic application to Christ. So now we have uh, the inspiration of Scripture extending to present and past tense verbs, singulars and plurals, mm -hmm. very detailed jots oh, and yeah, tittles. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but then we also have passages like, for example, uh, Matthew 1. Uh, where it says the three groups of 14. Uh, oh, yeah, 14. yeah, in the genealogy, that's you right. you ever count them? Yeah. The yeah. last group only has 13. Right, and they skip generations, which seems to be cheating yeah. if you're trying to hit the right. number. And so you have these, these kind of issues that come into play. Yeah. Uh, but here's, here's more of a, uh, something you can jump off. Yeah, yeah. Um, the idea of authorial intent, mm -hmm. okay, uh, seems to me a major jumping off place for reading things into the text, okay? Hmm. Uh, because we don't really have the author's intent. Mm -hmm. All we have is what they wrote. Mm -hmm. And if I'm to try to get to something beyond or behind or beneath what they wrote to try to get to this idea of author's intent, it would seem to me I'm introducing my view into Scripture rather than uh, what it actually says. So, uh, I mean, uh, maybe... The question, what it says? We're trying to figure out what it says. Right, so... so. We don't know what it 
So an example of trying to, a good example. Uh, no, what they're trying is what it means, not what it says. They're trying to get, well, it does, what it says is not really it, it's what they meant. Right. And right. they reinterpret the text based on this, I, what I've imagined the author's intent is. So I think here's a good example of where author's intent is super helpful. There's a tendency, I've been reading a lot of N.T. Wright lately, there's a tendency to go through Romans 3 and read it like, aha, this is to help Martin Luther argue against the Catholics, and like maybe it is useful for that, but like, what's the problem Paul is trying to solve? Whenever you read any author, you think, what's, what are they worried about? What problem are they trying to solve? And it's clear, if you, if you read Galatians, things like that, that Paul is super worried about a movement within the churches to say, if you're a Christian and you're a Gentile, you're going to have to follow the law as a badge of who's in the church and who's not. So that would be a great example of if you, if you can know some background about Paul and you know what problem he's trying to solve, it helps you in interpreting Romans. Whereas if you had no clue what problem he was trying to solve, you, you might be more likely to read your own issues and the problems you're trying to solve onto the text. So, yeah. So Good. just clarifying follow-up on yeah. that. So the adaptation view, could that, that's considered within inerrancy? Yeah, inerrancy would be okay with this. Okay. Like inerrancy would not be okay with this. So would you say that... Inerrancy, infallibility, and accommodation are like three big picture levels. Yeah, those or? are the three. I, those okay. are the three. I, and, and even infallible. Yeah, those are those are three kind of good broad words that people use to kind of deal with what perceived uh, uh, issues within scripture. So, so accommodation would necessarily be a subset of infallibility. Uh, something like that. Something like that. Accommodation would be a way that someone could say, I believe that Bible's, the Bible has authority, but there are errors in there. It's because God's accommodating our wrong, our wrong thoughts. So, and I mean, this, you could see why someone might think this is the case. Like if you imagine, imagine I sent you back in time to the 1200s with an iPhone and you had to explain to the people like why the iPhone works, you would start, eventually you would start using words like lightning which is not really true, but it's like the best you've got to explain to the people in the 1200s how the iPhone works. That's an example of accommodation. Because like, I ain't got no other words other than lightning to explain what's going on in this thing. So, does that make sense? Off the cuff illustrations are usually bad, but. Uh, maybe so. Uh, actually, maybe, maybe so, because it's not necessarily an error. Or it's not a deception. Whereas the stork thing actually is a deception. You're right, maybe, maybe the lightning business would be closer to adaptation. Or maybe the, Cal the Calvin God lisping, you know. God wants to say electricity and ions and all these kinds of things, but he can't, so he says lightning instead. So, yeah. Maybe the opposite example would be like if you told them, like, ah, the magicians make this work or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like magic or something. Right. Um, and interestingly, these issues come up big time uh, when it comes to Bible translation. I remember hearing years ago a, a man came to our, our, our Christian group at MIT and he, he had been involved in Bible translation for, for much of his career. And it's like, what do you do with passages that, about your sins being washed as white as snow, as snow when you go and translate it for a people who have no word for snow because they've never seen it? <laughs> so they started like, changing the Bible a lot. There, there, were, there were times where like, people would read. You know, there's a story about John the Baptist like wore camel hair and all this weird stuff. And he said, I'm not worthy to untie Jesus' sandal. There are people who read that like, oh, he's rich. He's got this weird camel hair thing. Awesome. And when he's not worthy to tie Jesus' shoe, that means he's too good to tie Jesus' shoe. And so, like, they got completely the wrong idea. So they had to, like, start really adapting the text of Scripture just to get across to this people group. And so those would all be examples of adaptation, of adaptation just to be able to get the message across without necessarily trying to introduce error. So, yeah, go ahead. I would, so, like, you talked about when you were talking about the accommodation, you talked about... Um, the cosmology stuff, like the earth revolves around the sun versus the truth of the sun. Sure, sure, sure. Earth. How do you, like, how do you, how does that, how do you explain that with, like, the adaptation view? Ooh, I don't know. See, this is where we need, are you all familiar with John Walton? So, someone, yeah, okay, I guess somebody is. Um, yeah, so the question, this is a, this is a good question. Hmm. Huh. I'll just give you kind of what I had in my mind when that popped up. I've been reading a lot of John Walton lately, and I don't know if I agree with him, but John Walton says Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and all these things, the original author and the original audience, the questions they're asking themselves is, how is our story of creation and story of our God different than the cultures around us? 
So, for instance, in ancient Egypt or ancient Babylon, the moon is like a goddess or something. And then you read Genesis 1, and it says, like, the moon is not a god or a goddess. It's a created thing created by God to be a light. And that's the point. That's what Walton says. Mm -hmm. And, of course, for us in the 20th or 21st century, we're like, but what's it made of? And when did it come together? They, Walton would say, like, the text is not out to answer that question. Right? So it's a good question. It's like, does Walton believe in inerrancy? I think he probably does because he's trying to honor authorial intent. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I guess that's what I mean by like ancient cosmology. Uh, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You have a better answer than me. Walton wrote a book called The Lost World of Scripture where he affirms what he means by inerrancy and defines it and all, and all that stuff. So to answer the original question with the sunrise and the accommodation thing, the thing that makes the accommodation of you bad is that it inserts a new false element, like the stork. Yeah. But if the stork was already there in the kid's thinking, then you could actually use that stork to explain something. So, for example, with the sunrise, before any type of divine communication, uh, these people already had an idea in their head that the sun was rising. That was a phenomenon that they saw. Well, you can use something that's already in the architecture of someone's belief to explain something. Um, and in that sense, you're kind of really going back and forth between both of these views. Um, but in the case of inerrancy, what Walton says is that the meaning of the text is not, or sorry, the meaning of the work is not rooted in the text itself. It's actually rooted in, it's behind the text, like Lynn was saying. This is where things get a little scary. So whenever Genesis um, uh, 4, uh, or 1-4 uh, says that God, or fourth day, whatever, when God created the moon as a light, that's the, the text. Um, so like what you were saying, that's not the meaning of the text. The meaning isn't God created a light source, which is the moon. The meaning is uh, the moon is not a divine object. So it's actually the, the words and the uh, concepts and whatnot that the author is using, um, those are kind of like the material elements that are actually carrying what his intent is. So you could just clear out and say, the moon is not a god, but instead he's chosen a different way to carry that. Yeah. This is, this is why it's helpful to know, like, what questions is the audience asking, what are they worried about, and what is the author worried about? I don't know. Does that, so, is it, is that helpful? To clarify what you're saying, Jack, is the accommodation view, you jump from adaption to accommodation when you introduce a false element. But if there's already a false element and you talk about it, that's still adaption. Possibly. Adapt it's, it's kind of in Maybe. between. Okay. It's in between those. Like, if I talk to my child about the sunrise, am I adapting to their language or am I accommodating their error? It's you, that's the fight you'd have to have. The, the problem is, yeah, it's not that you're introducing new error, it's that sometimes it takes more effort to remove that error than uh, to get your point across than it would just to use that error to communicate something else. Right. And, in, and in the case of the sunrise, it's yeah. easier to say the sunrise is beautiful rather than say, well, you know. Let's start with some physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, here we so, go. Fourteen yeah, yeah. billion years ago, there was a fusion of helium and right. it started. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So good. You know, hey, how, how are we on time, by the way? Do I know? We have. Yeah. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. It's nine thirty-nine. Okay. I know, but uh, what time do we need to, like, shut it down? Okay. When they kick us out. We sometimes go ten forty, ten fifty. Oh, in this room. Nine forty. Nine forty. Nine forty. You're on Eastern time, homie. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> all night long, nonstop. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, since the Hebrew or Masoretic text has so many different options for mm -hmm. uh, where you could get it from, uh, especially the Pentateuch, there's like everybody has their own. Um, why would you prefer the Masoretic text over the Septuagint, which I see is a common uh, choice? Among yeah, I think I think this question may be out of my league. Not in the Westminster. <laughs> no, that's not the right answer. Yeah, this question may be out of my league. I don't, I don't know enough about Old Testament texts. To, to, oh, it's next week? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of, I guess, an addendum, little pin on sure, at the end sure, sure. of Zach's point earlier. Yeah. I guess, so in regards to the kind of whether inerrancy was a conclusion or like a something. A starting point, yeah. Starting point. Yeah. Uh, you'd mentioned um, using Jesus's... Jesus' uh, approach to, of, yeah. to the but the I mean the specific verses you used were from scripture also so I oh, say kind of how good, would, good question so mm -hmm. um, if you want to say like how do we go from zero to how do I go from zero to inerrancy the the typical like Lee Strobel kind of way is to say all right do the gospels 
broadly tell me true things, like historically reliable things about this Jesus person and what he did and what he said and these reports of his tomb being empty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm not saying it's inerrant yet. I'm just saying it's generally historically reliable. Then you have to say, what am I going to do with this Jesus person? I have to kind of make some conclusion about what I, th what I think about him, what he was. And as soon as you then say, I think he really was the Son of God. I think he really was the Messiah. What did he think? Now I have this historically reliable record of what he thinks and whatever he thinks, I'm going to think. That's the, that's the like more or less the, the, the order. Case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. That's basically the idea. I don't think it actually, it rarely functions for someone in that way, because how many people really start at ground zero like Rene Descartes and try to build themselves up? But I mean, if you wanted to try, that's the way you would go. Yeah. I guess I'll probably do the last question since we're sure. just about out of time. So I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this, um, but it seems like when we're talking about things that constitute errors, like what constitutes an error, mm -hmm. a lot of these examples we'll come up with is like, well, here's some scientific issue we know is wrong today. Mm -hmm. like numbers or the earth or the cosmology or something right and we just say well they were kind of limited by what they knew so right. that's that's fine what about um but it also seems like anything historical like a king's name or date or something is not like that it would be it's very important that that's correct hmm. my um my question would be like a lot of especially in the old testament a lot of the books are written by people who weren't around for the history they are writing. So let's say someone, you know, got a date wrong or a king name wrong, um, but that was because the source they were getting it from was wrong. Mm -hmm. Would that be like, would that be like an oops moment? The Bible has an error in it. And w would we hold them accountable for that kind of thing? Or we should be like, well, you were limited by the information you had. I mean, it seems like, it seems like the way Jesus treats the Old Testament, he's assuming like, this is right dates and all and kings and all and so that's the the way i tend to land and i don't yeah i don't know of any i don't know of any like so you asked like what makes me the most nervous i don't know of any like home run the bible has no answer for this i don't know if there are any of those kind of things out there i will say there have been a number of times where people are like we have no record of xyz and then the excavations in israel have since unearthed it so so i'm very hesitant on the historical stuff like we're limited in what we can know about history so i'm usually pretty pretty hesitant to say like, okay, you've really nailed the Bible on this one just because people have thought they have before and yeah. been wrong. So yeah. anyway, but the reason I'm hesitant to say like to give grace to historical errors in the Old Testament or something is because it seems to imply an oops. Like I don't see why something inspired by God would have an oops. I guess what I was asking is like, it seems like when it's a science thing and there's an oops, it's, it's, um, uh, it's fine because you were limited by what you understood. But hmm. if it's a historical thing, maybe you were limited because you didn't have history textbooks. Yeah, I, I guess on the science thing, I don't even, I, I, I hesitate to even say they were limited by what they understood. Like miracle claims, mm -hmm. like I don't, I, do, I, I, I think miracles are possible and I'm never going to say like that miracle is impossible because of what we now know about science. Like I never go oh, yeah, that direction. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I guess by the sciencey stuff, you mean. Like the earth the, going around. The moon. So I think in that context. I, oh, I the sea. Yeah, yeah. So what Nathan's saying is that today we have tools of science that we use to reach a scientific conclusion. They didn't have those tools, so we shouldn't hold them to that standard. Likewise, we have modern views of historiography, modern sources, archaeology. You know, we can look to the earth with CT scans. It's crazy. Well, actually, we can't look at the CT scans. But X-ray, X-ray. That's like <laughs> what? No. We have yeah, bonkers giant stuff. Giant superconducting yeah. <laughs> We've got they the did, science. Yes, yeah, they didn't have that level of historiography, and they may not have even had the same concepts of historiography. Oh, I think now. See now. Okay, now yeah, we're now, now we're getting somewhere. So a modern journalist has has a tape recorder, right? I, and I'm going to account what you said word for word. And so if we went to Luke and say, How, why did you not get that quotation word for word? He would he would not say oops. He would say like get up off me. Like that's not my that's not my standard. That's not my genre. That's yeah. Not my, and I yeah. guess I was all saying if yeah. someone's writing a date or something about something. You know, way in the past, and the person they went to or to get that information from, or the book they went to. I'm not saying way in the future, but like, I'm I'm assuming that there's definitely information in the Old Testament where the author was not alive for so, the information. But th this is why, this is why the the concept of oops is so helpful. Yeah. I think it would be okay for a biblical author to be like. You're misunderstanding me. You're missing the point. Get up off me. Like any of those kind of responses is totally fine. Sure. Oops is not okay. 
Hmm. I think that's the one I can't deal with because it, it implies like, oh, I should have gotten this right and I didn't. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that may get to the historiography part. Like if you say, Luke, you didn't get the quote exactly right. He doesn't say oops, he's like, Pfft. Well, I think you know, it's maybe yeah. more, more to the issue of like, you know, the name of the Pharaoh in the Exodus story is kind of lost to history. Sure. And then we have like another 100,000 years worth of human history before that that's recorded in the book of Genesis. So if we have like a starting point of, we can't get this guy's name, but now we know all this stuff about Abraham and Joseph and Babel and Noah and stuff that's way, way, way earlier. You know, it seems like we might be will more willing to grant them grace uh, hmm. for, for not being able to retain all that information. Hmm. Or even having the materials to do that. Yeah, or, or, or caring to do that or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. These are good questions. Hmm. Okay, good. Good discussion. Uh, I hope, I'll just close with this. Do you all understand what I'm getting at with these little fights? Be nice to each other. <laughs> like that's, be, be, be kind to each other. Because I've seen, like literally churches and seminaries and all kinds of, of things have split over this. And in some cases it really did have to happen. In other cases it kind of didn't have to happen. So, so, so um, extend grace to each other. Uh, view the other person as a person like you and not just a, 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 you know, a villain or an enemy to be defeated. So, okay, great. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.